So um, the new year is a time when we look back on 2017 and reflect on the 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows of 2017. Yes? It's a time for us to look back and it's a time for us to look forward. So it's, we are at that crux at this point. So I just wanted to take a moment and, um, you know, see if uh, you have done any of such reflection. Did uh, any of you come to the intention setting on the 31st? Here, yes. Okay, so I see some yeses. All right. So there has been some, you know, in, in the, in the, held in the community, you did some reflection. Um, so I also want to know, um, did anyone else, did anyone set, a, set some intentions or, um, you know, goals for 2018? Um, you know, anything like that? Anyone? Yes? Okay. So, um, and, and you know, I'll, I'll talk about that. I'll come to that. I want to I wanna hear some of those. But, you know, let me start out with uh, just a, this reflection, you know, as, as we do this reflection of these 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows. So I'll, I want to talk a little bit about this. For my own self, as I reflected back, this 2017 has been a very deep and rich year for me in terms of my dharma practice. It's uh, it deepened at a, at, at an, it was just amazing how deep it has gone because I was invited to the Spirit Rock teacher training and the sangha that I have of the other teachers is so inspiring. So we just had Victoria teaching here before I came, she taught the POC Sangha, and uh, she's also in the teacher training with me. And, uh, you know, so just, and how much her um, teaching style influences me, you know, and I've just known her a few times in my Sangha. And then knowing Chandra and, um, you know, the women's group we started this year uh, here at Against the Stream. We, the four of us, Eve, Chandra, Juliana, and I, we thought about this women's group for several months. And then we started the group in February of this year. And so, you know, having that Sangha of women for us to sit together and to talk about some very significant topics, like the last time our discussion was extremely moving to me. It was about uh, all the uh, you know, the women that have come out, uh, you know, on all this sexual abuse that has been, you know, coming up in, in all different organizations. I mean, it's a very, very potent topic. So, you know, we have conversations like that. And to feel into the richness of those conversations and the courage that it takes for people to come into groups um, like we had last uh, in, in December. I don't know if we had in December or November. But in our last women's group, that was our discussion. So, you know, to have that kind of conversations is very, very heartening. So that's my 10,000 joys that I can speak about. And, you know, my 10,000 sorrows are, uh, you know, I've had some health challenges, but also the, the political situation in this country has been extremely painful to me. And it's been a daily event in my life, which, you know, I can't... Um, um, how do you say, I can't, I can't, you know, put a curtain before my eyes. And the, the divisiveness that is there in our country is so reflective of what is happening in terms of the climate change. So those are some of the things that affect me deeply. Um, and, but in, in all of that, I've also found that the freedom that is, that comes is not so much from the external. So sitting in the fire of my own personal and the environment and the societal uh, events, um, what I have discovered in this last year is that freedom is not something that I find in the external conditions. Even in the midst of swimming in the sea 
of ignorance and, and uh, suffering, you know, what I've experienced is that there is a sense of freedom that comes from my own inner awareness growing and, and seeing things as they are. And it takes, it takes courage, but at the same time, there is no other option that is available. And to see what is happening around me with an open and compassionate heart, that I think is being a very courageous and, and a very big gift of the Dharma. Not that I'm there all the time, but that is what I hope, and that's my practice, to be in that space as much as I can. Because, you know, the external environment, external circumstances I cannot control, but it's the internal space that I can find freedom in. And so that's some of the things that I want to talk to you about. I was just reading the Dalai Lama's message uh, for the New Year's. He says, it's important that we begin the New Year looking forward, that we should, you know, uh, let me reread this. It's important that we begin the New Year looking forward. We should project our intention ahead so that we can make this year meaningful, a meaningful one, and also have a sense of joy and happiness. So he says, when you look back, how would you think about the year that, ha- that you have spent? So I want to stop here. I want, don't want to read what he says further. I just want to stop here and I want to ask you, when you look back at this year, 2017, how do you think you have spent it? You know, do you have a, a sense of contentment about it? Um, do you know, do you have, you know, what, what wells up for you? You know, say a word or two about how do you feel about this last year? I'm sort of unsettled. Unsettled. Which way this is going to go? There, there's uh, forces involved. That, they just going to go the wrong way. Yes. And even though I think that you know justice will prevail in the end, it, it can be a struggle. Okay. Anyone else? What is this when you look back on this year, at your personal life, at your professional life? at the environment, at, in the soup of the society that you're living in. Well, yes? Well, I think, I think most of my actions were rash and done from a place of fear. Okay. Which is not an especially exciting thing to look at. Yeah, but you know, I, I, I appreciate and I just want to acknowledge the courage that it takes to be um, self-reflective and honest to be able to say that about your own self. So I appreciate you sharing that, you know. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes? There's all this external trouble, but I've taken care of myself in a way, in a positive way that, <coughs> that I never have before. Okay, that's wonderful. Yeah. So you found a way to, you know, take care of your own yeah, self. Made yes. The you made the changes. Yes. Yes, that's wonderful. Yeah. Anyone else as you look back on the year? Okay. So the Dalai Lama says, would you as you look back at the year that you spent Um, You know, how would you think about the year that you have spent? He says, would you have a sense of contentment, saying that I have lived that year well, or I have served the purpose of that year? Or would you be looking back with a sense of regret for all the troubles you have caused? And I just thought that was so interesting. That just stopped me. He says, 
Why did he say, for all the trouble you have caused? Because, you know, <laughs> from, my ego comes in and says, I didn't cause any trouble. <laughs> There are a lot of people I can point fingers at, you know, when I read the news, right? So, what do you think he's saying? What do you think he's saying? What does he mean by this sentence when he says, all the troubles you have caused? He does not even say, you may have caused, right? So, he doesn't even give you that wiggle room. What does he mean by that? Yes? Well, I'm, I don't know exactly what he means, but I feel like perhaps anyone, even the Dalai Lama, maybe could rub someone the wrong way through no intention. You know, even through no intention, <laughs> yeah. base, you know, anybody, anybody could do something in, with the full intention of being a good person. Yeah. And because of some other person's previous experience or, you know, who knows, who knows what, because they didn't have breakfast that morning. Yeah. You know, maybe they would have a, you know, people could have a better interaction. It could be as simple as that. Yeah, and, yeah. Or it could be harm on a more, I mean, if you want to, if you think about doing no harm to any creature or whatever, you could think about harm that you've done inadvertently to any number of other creatures outside of, outside of, you know, humanity. Yes, yes. Yeah, and you know, a couple of things come to mind, but you know, like in terms of doing harm to other creatures, whenever I use plastic, I always think about, you know, I mean, what am I doing to the ocean and to the fish? You know, there's so much plastic that's there, that's being tossed in there. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, you were going to say something. You? Yeah. yeah. Um, I was thinking about how the quote contrasted the feeling of contentment with the troubles that you've made, and it made me think of that quote uh, the, that more is lost through indecision the wrong decision, something about the idea of uh, the, the things that you may not have done or may not have fulfilled might cause more trouble than the things you did. Mm. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes. I just think about Yeah, that's so well said. And I don't know how this happens to me, just about, this is probably the third time I'm giving a talk and somebody in the room will say something and I'm like, did you read my talk before I came here? You just actually summarized what I was, where I was going. So that's a good preview, yes. So anyone else? Anyone else, yes. Yes. Or would you be looking back with a sense of regret for all the troubles you have caused? Yeah. I, I feel that, um, that he's inviting each person to really go inside and to look. You know, um, he's not saying that we have all caused troubles, although many of us have. Mm -hmm. Perhaps all of us have, I don't know. But um, I think if it's more of an invitation to reflect upon that and to, like, I didn't even think, when I think about troubles, I didn't even think about plastics until you said it. And I'm very plastic aware. So, and that's how we use our consciousness through, through taking time for introspection. Yeah. Yes. I think if he said, are you going to reflect on this and this and how you were da, 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 that would be a more direct statement than, mm -hmm. you know, that to me, that's how it feels to me, that, um, that yes, indeed, I have caused troubles. Okay. But I think we have to look inside of ourselves. Yeah, we have to look I'm inside, more yes. I'm aware than I was five years ago or ten years or twenty years ago. It's because of those processes. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and, and being a meditator, that just becomes, you become self-reflective. Yeah. So, uh, yes? I guess I think maybe a meaning is that uh, I'd flip it over and say that he is saying that, of course we cause troubles, each one of us. We cause troubles, each one of us, every day. But that's that's okay. We can't we can't say that our goal is to not cause any troubles mm-hmm. because then we'd probably go into some state of denial about ourselves. And maybe we can be more mindful of our troubles, but we have to accept that we will cause some troubles. Yes. Yeah. I so uh, you know I so appreciate you saying that. Because, you know, as I heard him say this, I feel that, you know, we, even the fact that you, that I'm sitting here breathing, I'm causing harm because there are, you know, these really small microbes that are going into my body and they're dying because the heat in my body is much more than the uh, the atmospheric temperature. So I'm, even in this process of just sitting here, I am causing harm. That's just the nature of my existence as a human being. But if I were to sit here and, you know, to, to, and I mean, I just take this as one example, but if there is something I have done in the past year, I look back upon and I, you know, it causes me regret. And I, you know, spin in that regret and despair and then it goes into deeper and deeper grief and pain. What am I doing is I am causing more suffering to myself. So there is a level at which, you know, there is a level at which you look upon things and yes, you are a human being, you will cause harm. And there are some things in your past you cannot change. And then you have to take that as, okay, I did act unskillfully. And there is a level at which then you forgive yourself. Hopefully you don't repeat that. Yeah? So there is that aspect. And, you know, when, when, you, when you started out and you said about the Dalai Lama and, you know, maybe he has done something. He actually, one of the stories I read is that there was a monk, you know, he gives a certain, I'm going off the script here, but he gives a certain initiation to monks for their practice. And then they'll practice for like many decades, and that's what causes liberation. One monk came to him, and the Dalai Lama said, no, you know, you're too old for you to start this practice. So the monk really wanted that mantra or that initiation, and the Dalai Lama did not offer that to him. So the monk went and killed himself. And, you know, even as I say this, my heart always hurts when I think of that, the the dedication, you know, just the intensity of that monk's practice because he said if I don't get this initiation in this lifetime I'm just going to die so that I will be reborn and then I can start young and you know I mean it just touches me that that's the intensity of that monk's practice it's very inspiring to me but when the Dalai Lama heard that you know he did not go into regret you know, of course he felt regret, yes, but he did, doesn't take that and wallow in that, which is something, you know, it takes practice not to do that, right? You know, it's a deep, deep practice that the Dalai Lama has of equanimity, of loving kindness and compassion, that, you know, he did not go into such huge amount of self-blame and self-criticism. If that happened to me, you know, I don't know how I would handle that. But the Dalai Lama, you know, so that's one of the things that I think about as well. When you look upon your past and you have made mistakes, you know, hopefully your mistake is not as big as the Dalai Lama's, you know, then you can hold your own self, hold yourself accountable for sure, but not with uh, self-denigration or uh, self-judgment. You know, that does not help. Because that is the added suffering. So in the first Noble Truth we talk about there will be suffering 
there is suffering, but then the added piece is the self-judgment, the regret is what we cause. That's the additional piece. So moving on, he says, if an individual were to make conscious intention to live his or her life with a sense of purpose, live it in a good way, then the ripple effect of that really spreads from the individual to the family, to the community, to the society. That's how the society gets changed and affected. So you just said that, right? So that is really, you know, it's, if, if we as Dharma practitioners, if we make a change within our own self, that is the ripple effect of your meditation practice. So the loving kindness practice that you did today, and you know, that's the ripple effect of that. The, the, uh, the compassion and that, the calmness that meditation brings within you affects the people you are around, your friends, your family, and then it affects others. Yeah, so that's how you change society. And so he says, uh, when we talk about transformation of a society, the transformation really has to start from the individual, from inside to outwards. And when I was reading this, it reminded me of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, how, you know, uh, he was thrown off the train in, uh, when he was in South Africa. And he was a young and a very good lawyer. So he could afford to be in the first class in the train, but you know, because he was a person of color, he was not allowed to, uh, even despite owning a ticket, he was not allowed in that, in that train. So he was thrown off and he was extremely angry. He sat on the platform the whole night, wondering what to do, you know, just this fight going on in his own mind, you know, uh, just, what to do? Should he just go ahead and leave and, you know, never practice law in this country? But instead, what he decided to do is he came up with the nonviolent movement, which he tried in South Africa. And then he took that and he developed it deeper and deeper in India. And that affected, you know, the entire society. The whole country changed. We won our freedom. And not only did India change, but that template was also used by Martin Luther King in the movement here in US, right? So there is one man taking his practice affects so much. You know, it can, it can have a ripple effect. So um, let me see. So I wanted to read you a poem by this Indian poet. Um, again, you know, talking about intention, right? So it's a, uh, it's a poem, with a, when I first read it, I was like, oh, he's, he's kind of like, it's his intention for, uh, you know, maybe himself. Um, but, you know, as I read more and more, it's not just for himself, he was holding this intention for, um, the whole society, the whole Indian society. And I thought that was extremely sweet. Um, this is Gitanjali, and I hope to go back and read the whole poem. Um, it's a, a, he's a very famous Indian poet, Rabindranath Tagore. And he says, you know, just imagine, I mean, if we had a, uh, just as, you know, we are here sitting and meditating, if our effect was, you know, in, in, you know, moved to and affected the other people around us. So if it affected our whole society. So he says, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, 
where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led into ever-widening thought and action. So that's what is his intention that he's holding, not just for himself, but for the whole of the society that he's living in. So again, you know, coming back to that the freedom we seek is not whether we can control the circumstances, but it's much more subtle. It's a... Um, it's about, you know, what we cultivate within ourself. It's the compassion that we cultivate. It's that awareness that we cultivate to see things as they are. And from that, you know, coming to um, some of the changes that can be affected, you know, I'll give you some of the examples as I was thinking um, today that there is, you know, the, what kind of, so he, the, the poem with Rabindranath Tagore's poem, he's talking about a certain level of um, there is a certain level that he wants to see in the people, you know. And I was wondering, as I read that poem, I was wondering, where have I seen this? So like I said, you know, I've, I have a day job, I work in the business world, and so I was thinking about the people that I work with. And I remembered that there is a woman in my office who prepares uh, meals for the elderly in the project Open Hand. And so uh, we, when we have our community support program in, my, in, in our office, uh, which, you know, in, according to me, we have like these community support programs, one too many times in a year, but I think we have at least two or three times in a year. And so she introduced us to Project Open Hand and she has taken teams from our company um, to do the work over there. And so, you know, we don't do this work only in the holidays, you know, we do it in, in the middle of the year as well. And then, you know, was, then there was someone else who uh, brought awareness of these non-profits where there is a non-profit where you go and you ride a bike, no matter what your level of um, physical ability is, you know, how, um, um, how physically healthy you are or anything. You can ride just a certain small amount, small distance. And what that does is it helps the people who are disabled, you're riding for them, yeah? And then I was also thinking about this young man that I met, he was from India, you know, but he, he's born here. And I remember taking a walk with him and he was on fire about, this was, you know, like almost, I think seven or eight years ago, he was on fire about what's happening in, in our society at that time in terms of, you know, how we are treating people of color and how we are treating the LBGTQ community. So he started his nonprofit, which he called bemore.org. And I just recently checked his website and he's been doing these seminars for all the different organizations. And he has really grown because it's something he was so passionate about. So, you know, what I'm saying is that there are small and larger ways how we bring about change. But it's, it's you know, our intention that we hold on to if we want to bring about that change. And, you know, I was also reading a story by Jack Cornfield in his book. He says, he talks about a school principal who in the evenings um, would make um, sandwiches for, you know, she lived in a neighborhood which was not so well off, so she would make sandwiches and go and, you know, give it to the homeless people uh, around her. And so slowly, you know, like, word got out and, you know, they did an interview and, you know, she became a small celebrity and, you know, all the people around her came to know and they started sending her money. So. She, she took them, she would return the money that each and every person sent her with just one line note and that said, 
make your own damn sandwich. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so <laughs> I thought that was so funny. But you know, I mean, it's also like, you know, I mean, you go out and you do this activism, and, but the, there is the other side to it also, that there is, as you do the work, and you're trying to effect change in the society, or even in just your community, you know, there is a, there may be, you cannot make some changes, you know. Um, to give you an example, I'm just trying to clean up our, we, being in San Francisco, it's such a rare thing that we have a little bit of land in the, uh, between two buildings. And it's, you know, I can't seem to get our own building people to, to make the change, to kind of like, you know, get that place cleaned up and put plants. So I've had a lot of, um, you know, um, resistance to that. And it's just a small little thing. So imagine like if you're trying to make a bigger change, you know, you will find some resistance and there will be some obstacles that come. So Thomas Merton um, gave this advice to a frustrated young activist, which I thought is, you know, for, it's good for us to keep in mind. He says, do not depend on the hope of results. You may have to face the fact that your work will be apparently worthless and even achieve no results at all, if not perhaps results opposite to what you expect. As you get used to this idea, you should more and more, you should start more and more to concentrate not on the result, but on the value, the rightness, the truth of the work itself. So again, he's saying, what is he saying? He's saying, drop down to what are your values. What is it in your heart that's motivating you to go and do this particular work? So what is it in my heart that's motivating me to go and clean up this area that's behind our, our building? You know, to stay in touch with that, no matter how much you, you know, you may not, I may not accomplish what I'm setting out to do, or even get the opposite result, which, you know, I mean, that would really be very frustrating. But in the end, what you want to stay in touch with is, what is it in your heart that's the motivator for you to bring about some change? For you to, you know, uh, to, to kind of like, you know, the, like uh, this, this young man, uh, Anurag, who started the bemore.org, or to be like the school principal, right? It's not so much as for her to be a celebrity, but for her, what's the value that's there for her is that she wants to help. And maybe some people may accept her sandwich and some people may not. And I mean, I don't know if you've experienced this in San Francisco, there are some homeless people, they'll completely reject any help, you know, they're just so, they have their own self-respect, you know? Uh, they don't want, they don't want you to take care of them in, in, in that way. Um, so, um, let me see how I'm doing on time. Okay, so let me read something to you. Uh, it's a poem called Enlightenment by um, an Indian poet, Vijay Shishedri. It's all empty, empty, the sex and drugs, the violence especially, he said to himself. And he went down into the world to exercise his virtue, thinking maybe that would help. He taught a little kid to build a kite. He found a cure, and then he found a cure for his cure. He gave a woman at the weather of the mercy his <coughs> umbrella. He settled a revolution in Spain, but nothing worked. The world happens, the world changes. But what he gets in touch with is, oh yes, your compassionate nature, your compassion for your own kind. So I've like, you know, summarized some of the, taken out some of the parts from the poem, but I just wanted to leave you with that much. 
is in the end, it's not so much as, I'm not saying don't go out and do things. Go out and do things, but for us as Dharma practitioners, we are self-reflective. So what is important is our intention. What is our value? For us to stay in touch with our value. So that if you in case, if you start one project and that's not successful, as long as you're true to your value, you will go out and do something else. And maybe that will blossom. So in 2018, what I hope and I wish for you is that you practice with all your heart, that you practice whatever is your intention, you go so deep in it that nothing else matters, that your intention is aligned to your inner core value. That's what I wish for you in 2018. And that your practice is, you're so deeply motivated by your own practice that nothing <coughs> shakes you, that you stay the course, no matter what. And there will be a lot that will come at us because if you've seen the last year, you know, things will come, come at us. We have learned as a Sangha to stay together. So I really hope that you come and you take refuge in our Sangha here. It is such a significant, such an important, such a nourishing thing. We are blessed to have this Sangha and all the different programs that are offered here at Against the Stream and at the different Sanghas in, in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, that you allow the support of the different Sangha to hold you and that you are not doing this alone, you are not doing your life alone, that you stay connected in the Dharma stream. So that's what I wish for you. I, I wish that you're completely passionate about your practice, about your intention, and that you stay the course with your intention throughout the year. It's not a one-time event. You know, that's what I wish for you that, that you, that you learn to sit in the fire of your suffering, and that as you sit and you watch this suffering within you and around you, that it does not isolate you, it does not um, um, throw you into despair. But more than that, what it does is it kind of like break your heart open. It melts, this fire of suffering may melt your heart, warm you up so that you connect. Because all of us, are in this together. And, you know, I was reading uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, he said it so beautifully. Um, but before I go to the, that piece, um, let me see. Yeah, actually, let me read what Thich Nhat Hanh has to say about suffering. He says, he says, um, handling our suffering is an art. He says, if we know to suffer, we suffer much less. And we're no longer afraid of being overwhelmed by the suffering inside. Instead, we should fear not knowing how to handle our suffering. So that's why I, what I wish for you is that, that as you sit and as you go through your suffering, you can really stay with it. You use the four foundations of mindfulness. You use your breath. You use that grounding that I did at the beginning of our meditation. You bring in the metta practices. You bring in equanimity to hold you through all of the suffering that, all, that we are going to go through together. And that you remember the Sangha. That's why one of the things when I started is I said, I hope that you remember to, that you 
hope to, you know, that you connect with the Buddha within you, that this Dharma within you, and the Sangha not just outside, but the Sangha inside. So as you sit in your meditation, for you to remember the Sangha that you're sitting with here, to take them with you, so that you're never alone in your suffering. Because that really, I don't know about you, but that really gets me, is when I, when I go into that isolated space. It really takes me down. And it's not a true space, actually. So it's, and then, as you sit in this suffering, and you come into this space of, of holding your suffering, then you can be, then you can make a conscious <coughs> choice to be a light to your own self and to un- others. Just as the Buddha said, you know, that in this practice, this is not a, you know, this is not, the, we are all, this is, you know, this is all, all of you have the Buddha within you, just as I do. So in that sense, all of us are equal. Yes? So that's why the Buddha said, be a light unto yourself. And that's what I mean, as you sit with your suffering, as you connect with the Buddha, with the Dharma within you, and with the Sangha within you, then you make a conscious choice to be that light, and to shine in each and every moment of your life. You stay with the Dharma on every single moment. Because this time is such, it's such an intense time we are living in, that there is an immediacy to our practice. So there is just a nowness, and that now, right now, is the only refuge. Because if we look too much into the future, it's a scary future. At least to me, I speak for myself. You know, in the past is there has been a lot. So the right now is a space of refuge. So coming into that space through your meditation practice. Yeah. So that's all that I had, but I have some time for questions as well. Um, I did have some ad- additional pieces, but you know I don't want to go into that. Um, I'll stop here and see, open it up for any questions or comments, anything that's come up for you as you've been sitting here listening to this. If you feel you want to, you know, if you feel uh, like sharing some your intention, you know, you. I'd love to hear that as well. Yes. It's a different topic. Almost reminds me of the last time I saw you here. Um, could you speak a little? I'm in in my practice. I'm working on understanding and embracing mercy and compassion and trying to understand how they overlap and how they are different. And also the, the word mercy, you know, can have many different kinds of meanings. Uh, and there some of them wouldn't be applicable to Buddhist path. Yeah, yeah. And that's okay uh, if they're not. But uh, when when you so tell me a little more about you know what is it that you're doing in this practice? Is it you know towards your own self? Is it towards someone else? Is it a particular situation? I um, interestingly when when I started doing more of the loving kindness meditation, I just thought. Oh, I don't do that because all of my work, all of my work goes out to others. It always goes out to others. It's what I'm able to do, you know, with work to support myself, and it's how I live my life. And um, then I began to really see the value of you know, giving it to myself. Uh-huh. But really, I'm looking, my intentions for this year were really to cultivate joy and mercy, Uh genuine mercy. And and as I sit here and listen to you, I I realize that 
you know, that, that the job can be as enormous or as small as I want it to be. I, I know some of you and many I don't, but I, I, for 27 years I've, I've done dog rescue. Mm -hmm. and, and I just, I'm at a point where I can't see some of these things anymore. It's really, yeah. you know, it's like every day, like the images and the stories and the pleas. And I think, where is the justice? Where is the justice? And, you know, we're rescuing dogs and that's good, but I feel like I need to do something different. Mm. I feel like what I'm doing with my work needs, I want for it to evolve into something where, where we're able to, to help touch people's hearts so that not only with animals but even toward other human beings and all beings, that people are not so cruel. Mm. And that's what I want to do through my work. And that's what I'm looking at. Okay. You know, now I remember a conversation with yes. you. I remember you saying this. and um, I'm having the same response I had at that time. You know, my heart just... Uh, I, I'm a puppy owner. And, you know, suddenly I'm part of this dog community. And, uh, you know, I'm just so grateful that you, that you take care of them. Because I've seen some people who have um, rescue dogs, you know, that they have adopted who have like three legs or, you know, blind and, you know, I mean, I'm just, just touched that somebody would have the courage to do that because I know how much effort it takes just to take care of my puppy. And I then here it is. It, I, I want to take it past, I, mean, I know there's no answer here in this room right now, but as I sit and listen to you and I think about the intentions I made, now I start to think I have to go inward. How, how do I, I think it's in cultivating the kindness and the awareness that I want in myself that I'll begin to understand how to put that back out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the kindness that you have towards the animal, you know. Yeah. I mean, that I think is your through line as you speak, you know, that's the deeper value that you have is the kindness towards the, you know, that you feel towards the animal, the compassion, you know, that you have for the animal. I don't think it's enough to do that anymore, though. I, I every day, I, you know, constantly, if we all do, we see stories, and mm -hmm. there's so much suffering in this world. Yeah. There's just so much suffering. I see it with the animals. Someone who works with the homeless will see it with the with homeless. the people. Yes. How do yes. We, how do we change? How do we live as an example and inspire others through our actions to be kinder, more well, generous of spirit? You know that that's you hold that for yourself, and something will come up for you, and you know I really do hope that that happens, but you know you are the more it, it affects your heart space, the more you're drawn into doing something about it, right? So it's not just, you know, like sitting there and in your own space, meditating or just doing your work. Now you're being called to do something about it and it will come to you. Yeah, yeah, but just stay with, stay with the, this, this feeling that you have, and it's not easy. It's not an easy place. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry I don't have a concrete answer for but, you. But really, my original question was how the differences between compassion and mercy, are they the same? values, would you say? I don't think they are the same. And again, you know, like, I mean, mercy, like you yourself said, has so many different meanings and connotations. You know, so I think of it as, so I, I want to just take it in the form of forgiveness. So that is a different, you know, that's different. Versus uh, compassion is a very different place. So there are different practices also in, in our um, 
Buddhist meditation practices, they're different practices also. And, you know, the only thing I can offer in this is that I, I, the, the Buddha said that, you know, uh, so let's say you're holding some anger or resentment against someone. That's like, you know, holding a hot coal, that you're holding this hot coal that's burning through your hand and you're walking towards this person to throw it on their face. And it's not until you realize that this hot coal is burning me, then you open your hand and you release and you come into forgiveness. So again, it's a matter of like, if you don't feel the pinch of the suffering of your own anger and resentment on your own self, because that does affect our immune system and it does affect our body, it affects the peace of our mind. It affects our behavior towards other people and towards our own self. So until then, you know, forgiveness is, doesn't come that deeply, is my experience of it. So, yeah.